Five. Draw the curtains and expand your mind. It's time to get textual as we traverse the illicit pages of wrong think in the Forbidden Book Club. Yes, indeed. It's time for the Forbidden Book Club, my favorite part of the show. Um, as I've confessed to you before, uh, and I'll confess to you again, I'm uh, bookish. I'm a book nerd. I like uh, transgressive literature. I like things that um, simmer away on the margins, uh, that ask the difficult questions. Um, and so today I wanted to talk uh, about a very, very, very interesting book. Uh, it's called Terror on the Tube, Behind the Veil of 7-7, an investigation. Um, now, this relates to the uh, bombings that took place on the London Underground, uh, un underground rail system on the 7th of July, um, 2005, so essentially 17 years ago, um, you may ask, as you have every right to ask, what's the relevance of this? Why are we discussing this this book today, Terror on the Tube? And I, I would uh, advance the proposition to you that there's a number of reasons why this is relevant, and I think they'll become fairly obvious, but the very first one that I want to suggest to you why this is still relevant today is, in fact, its absence, the absence. Cast your mind back three years. This is very telling and very important in, in my view. Cast your mind back, if you can, three years before the current um, psychological trauma operation and cast your mind back to one of the previous psychological trauma operations, the supposed war on terror and all these terrorist attacks that happened. I mean, they were uncountable at, at some stages. The, the numbers of them that were going on uh, around the world, uh, even in sleepy, stupid Australia, Europe, the US, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All over the place, there was this rash of these supposedly um uh, Islamic uh, terror attacks. It was never very clear what the precise motivation for them was actually really, supposedly. Um, I am going to suggest to you that uh, they were, all of these attacks were fraudulent on at least one level. I'm not alleging that they didn't happen or that people weren't injured or, or killed in them necessarily but that i'm what i'm alleging to you the fraudulent aspect of these terrorist attacks is who was ultimately behind them that is the part that i would suggest is the fraudulent bit um and i would note when i sa said just before that i think the right now the most relevant part of the war on terror is its absence the fact that it disappeared overnight actually, that simply somebody flicked a switch and the war on terror disappeared and the what I would call the war on humanity, um, the uh, COVID farce uh, began almost overnight. These, these uh, terrorist attacks, which were um, omniscient, in the media, in the media ecosphere, you could not go anywhere without hearing about them. T terror, 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 fear, 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 bombings, shootings, silly duffers with explosives in their underwear or in their shoes or all sorts of things which are patently ridiculous, really. Um, almost as ridiculous as all that footage out of Wuhan from two and a half years ago. Um all of a sudden, this narrative, this narrative, be terrorised, be frightened of the bombs, blah, 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 all these ridiculous, even up here in the hillbilly central nowheresville, uh, you, you start to have these bins at train stations that were replaced with, with uh, transparent see-through bins so that, you know, Osama bin Laden 
wouldn't put his bins at the region uh, bombs at the regional train station and all this sort of idiotic nonsense you know concrete bollards everywhere blah 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 all this uh terrorism theater to to uh terrorize the population and justify all sorts of draconian uh national security laws that would rob people of the most basic vestiges and illusions of freedom and and um rights that they might think that they had and would push through would be used to push through all sorts of surveillance overreach and biosecurity laws all sorts of nefarious things were all done in the guise of a response to terrorism terrorism which all of a sudden when a different operation started it all disappeared gone I would suggest to you, it's it's my theory that apart from anything else, that strongly suggests that the people who were running this operation, and I sincerely believe it was an operation, are also running the current operation. And that they know that they are they coordinate and they know that they can't really terrorize the population from multiple angles all at once because they'll probably just collapse into quivering messes so the the fear campaigns have to be strategic they have to be directed they have to come from you know finite deliberate points and then when you're done with this one the terrorism psychological warfare operation then you can move on to the next one the covid one or the food chain collapse one or the um, inflation one or the blah 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 whatever's coming next down the pike so now i'm assuming some of you are aware of these ideas and have your own suspicions about um these activities for some of you this this may be a new idea so um i understand that you it may not have been of interest to you or, or whatnot but this this book uh it really is. I highly recommend it to you. Uh, it's still fascinating reading. Uh, it's written by this fellow here, Nicholas Collestrom. Uh, he was um, once upon a time a respected um, uh, scientific historian in the UK. Uh, he was a member of the Royal Society. Uh, you can't get much more insider than that. But then he um, deviated from the path. He left the reservation and started writing books like this and other books which are even um, less acceptable and more off the, re the reservation than this one. And so now he's a complete outcast, uh, this fellow. So in this book, he um, digs up all sorts of, you know, reasonably, some of them are reasonably obvious holes in the official narrative. Like all these operations, if you poke the official narrative hard enough, it tends to fall over. Uh, it's just a facade you know, built um, to corral, you know, that percentage of the population who are unquestioning, who have no questions to ask whatsoever of any authority or official sources. If you ask questions and you poke these narratives, they tend to be full of holes and they tend to fall over pretty pretty easily, really. And so um, the author asks some pretty uh, common sense questions and asks for pretty straightforward evidence. And he essentially demolishes the official story. So the official story, if you cast your mind back, you may remember this. It was in London. It was in 2005. There were three uh, underground trains that, that bombs went off in, I think, uh, supposedly 52 people died um uh you saw photos of the train carriages it looked horrific uh, a, a a bus uh, above ground obviously a, a bus also had a, a bomb placed on it and i do believe uh, if i remember correctly 52 people died and a lot of people were injured in these uh, horrific attacks um but there are questions there we go there's the bus that uh, I think it was the number 30 bus from Piccadilly uh, had a bomb on the top story and blew the top of the bus off. Interestingly, um, 
They, exactly. Thank you, my correspondent. I was going to say, yes, in Tavistock Square in London, I believe out the front of the Tavistock Institute. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, somebody's trying to send us a signal. Um, and the that bus also, and I, I don't want to go down too, down too many rabbit holes, but that bus also had a film, uh, an ad for uh, a film called, I think it was The Descent on the side of the ad, which... Um, uh, on the bus, on the side of the bus, and the ad's uh, tagline was, you know, dizzying descent into horror or and terror or something like this, which is interesting, isn't it? Uh, almost like it's all designed as a, some sort of psychological operation. Anyway, that happened in Tavistock Square. Anyway, to cut to the chase, and I'm just going to. You should read this book yourself if you're at all interested. I'm just going to pluck out three examples where Colostrum shows that the na the official narrative falls to bits or looks highly dubious when you pull it apart, okay, even in the most sort of simple fashion. Now, the first of those is a fellow called Peter Power, who on the day of those attacks, the 7th of July, 2005, that's right, Ed, this fellow here, Peter Power, who uh, was a former um, policeman and a former soldier and uh, was working in Scotland Yard's anti-terrorism branch. He had gone private by 2005 and had his own company called Visor Consultants who worked on um, real-time uh, crisis management uh uh, you know, war gaming activities and these sorts of situations for uh, corporations and companies and so forth. On the day of the attacks, on the afternoon of the attacks, Peter Power uh, went on the BBC. They'd invited him on for some interesting reason. And he, uh, there's, there's his Wiki Spooks entry. <coughs> it's a very interesting website, Wiki Spooks. A good, good resource, actually. Um, he went on the BBC the afternoon of the attacks and uh, said very interestingly that that day, that very morning, at 9 o'clock in the morning, precisely uh, when these bombs had, in fact, gone off on the London Underground, he was running an exercise that very morning in London, uh, a tabletop exercise, uh, an anti-terrorism crisis management uh, exercise where... Um, they had uh, were, were in hypothetically responding to three bombings that were in fact the exact same stations that were bombed in the real world scenario at exactly the same time. That is very, very interesting. I think Peter Power, for whatever reasons, and possibly it was to protect himself, uh, let the cat out of the bag there possibly deliberately, um, and drew people's attention to the fact that they were running a drill at exactly the same time in exactly the same places with exactly the same bombing events occurring at exactly the same time they were running this drill. Isn't that interesting? Um, that's also happened on 9-11 and many of these other terrorist events have had drills with the basic or, in fact, the identical scenario happening at the same time. And that is a pretty good way to mask or hide your preparations to run one of these events, I'm suggesting to you, is to run in parallel, concurrently run a drill so that you can have people in position, you can, you can um, be organising uh, resources and all sorts of things and all of a sudden, the drill goes live and you've got your terrorist event. Really, uh, it's a it's a common uh, playbook in these uh, terrorism attacks that there is a concurrent parallel drill happening at the same time. And I would suggest to you, if, if they ever bring back this war on terror nonsense, which they may well do if they run out of other scams, um, if there's any sign of a drill happening nearby, I'd exit the building immediately if I were you. Um, so Peter Power also appeared, a, 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 I think, almost exactly a year 
before these bombings on the London underground, Peter Power coincidentally appeared on a program on the BBC, Panorama, it's a well-known uh, program on the BBC, and he was involved in this sort of panel discussion, uh, this sort of anti-terrorism, uh, or this, this sort of, sort of uh, terrorism simulation that was almost, again, identical to what happened in the real world a year later. Three bombs on three tube trains. There he is. That's a screen grab of Peter Power almost exactly a year beforehand on the BBC program Panorama. That is almost identical to the scenario that happens in the real world a year later. Um, isn't that interesting? Um, I've actually got the quote actually from Peter um, Power that he um uh, said on uh, the BBC that afternoon um, of the attacks. I'm going to read it to you because I think it's uh, very, very interesting. Uh, and this is a quote from Peter Powell, that the afternoon of the attacks. At half past nine this morning, we were actually running an exercise for a company of over a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway station's where it happened this morning. And he went on to say that it made the uh, hairs on the back of his neck uh, stand up, being involved in an operation that was almost identical to the thing that happened in the real world. I'm going to suggest to you that that is highly, highly suspicious. As I said just a few moments ago, this is a typical situation in these terrorist attacks. Um, there are drills of that are almost identical running concurrently uh of course you have to have in an operation like this you have to have patsies uh there were um four um uh, islamic uh young uh, gentlemen who were uh fingered uh as as the uh patsies um they're all supposedly suicide bombers so they're all dead so they can't defend themselves, obviously. Um, that's always a very convenient thing. So Nick Nick Collistrom pulls apart uh, the narrative, the official narrative, and he pulls it apart uh, sometimes in devastating fashion. So the uh, the 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 uh, government agencies and the media, they're almost the same thing, aren't they? Um, released a whole narrative around these bombings, saying that these four uh, gentlemen had uh, left on a train from uh, Luton, I think it was, parked the cars in the Luton train station car park, whatever, uh, got on uh, a, a 7.40 a.m. train from Luton to, uh, I guess it was King's Cross in London. Um, they the, the media said that the... Um, I agree. Um, they, they, um, the, the media said that they had the best... Uh, they had the... Um, um, surveillance footage, um, CCTV images of these fellows uh, entering the stations, time stamped at the right times. They even released stills from this um, surveillance footage from the uh, train stations, uh, time stamped with supposedly these four gentlemen uh, entering uh, Luton Station at, at the time to catch their 740 train. They built this whole narrative uh, this was the official story that they'd been on this 7:40 a.m. train from Luton. They got off at King's Cross. There was more uh, stills released from surveillance footage showing them leaving the station, you know, or, or walking through King's Cross Station as they got off the 7:40 a.m. train. Um, it was time stamped and it all, uh, you know, corresponded and uh, so forth. This, this whole narrative was built and repeated by the media ad nauseum, blah, 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 to build up in people's minds the guilt of these young fellows. There was just one problem. Uh, Nick Collistrom, the author uh, of this book, uh, went to, uh, I think he went to King's Cross Station and he spoke to somebody there in person asking them for their schedule that 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 morning of the trains and whether they'd been delayed or there are any cancellations and this kind of thing and uh the helpful person at the train station gave him the uh the train station's official rundown of, of how you know if there were any delayed trains that day or any cancellations 
And there were many that morning. In fact, all the trains coming in from Luton were uh, heavily delayed by sometimes by half an hour or so, which already blows out their whole narrative. Of all, don't forget these images released to the media were time stamped. Um, ouch. Um, and also the very, very interesting information that the 7.40 a.m. train that morning that they caught to King's Cross so that they could let off their bombs on the trains and kill all these people and do all these horrible things, that train was cancelled that morning. And there were multiple witnesses who said they were waiting for the 7.40 a.m. train from Luton and that it was indeed cancelled, so... You had two uh, informational uh, points there, two data points there. Not only was there the official rundown from the train station saying the 7.40 a.m. train was cancelled, you also had witnesses who said the train was cancelled. I couldn't get it. I had to get a later train to London, which made me late for work, blah, 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 blah. So he, uh, Colstrom wrote this in his book. Don't think for a moment that the powers that be, that shouldn't be, aren't paying attention to this kind of stuff. They immediately, and in Parliament in the UK, had to deconstruct their, rather embarrassingly, had to deconstruct their narr narrative and their timeline, discard all those photos that were time-stamped with times that only corresponded to them getting on that particular train. I know I'm going into a lot of detail here, but I think it's important th that uh, you understand how this whole narrative that they constructed with all sorts of evidence was blown apart instantly uh, by this book. Colstrom actually had uh, has the timetables in here, the cancellations. He reproduces them in here, the, all the information's in the book. It blew apart their whole official narrative. They had to hurriedly reconstruct another one, which was even more stupid, um, uh, in a very embarrassing uh, fashion. Um, and... Uh, the third point that I wanted to raise about that, and that's surely that's enough already to ask serious questions about these kind of events. But the third one, and I remember this very clearly from the time, is there were reports in the earliest media reports, which are always the most interesting ones. They're the least filtered ones, the least controlled ones. Um, was that three uh, s potential suicide bombers had been shot by the police or uh special branch uh at canary wharf in london about uh i think an hour after the bomb supposedly went off so there's all sorts of questions already in there i remember seeing news reports uh in the print media um at the time uh saying that there were witnesses who had said that um at, at canary wharf in london which has got a lot of you know, swanky high-rise buildings and a lot of media are there. Um, these three, three of these supposed suicide bombers who's been supposedly blown themselves to bits on these trains were actually shot out in front of these buildings by um, snipers, by um, police snipers, anti-terrorist unit snipers. And the people in the buildings were told not to look out of the buildings. They were not allowed to look out the windows. They had to move away from the windows as far as they could while that scene was cleaned up, uh, and that went on for a number of hours. That story, which I personally saw with my own eyes uh, in the um, online print media, you know, the Guardian or the Age or wherever I saw it, um, that story then just disappeared. It was gone. A few hours later, it, it, it was gone. And as Colstrom builds in his book very convincingly, and, and as I actually thought at the time myself, what's going on here? It sounds like they've had some patsies who've gone off reservation. In fact, they've missed their train. Let's just assume for a moment they were probably part of some sort of training exercise. They've probably been recruited for some sort of training exercise, anti terrorism training exercise. These young men probably in their innocence thought they were cooperating with the police or the uh, intelligence agencies or you know mi5 or whoever in their innocence they thought that they were being um good representatives of their community and cooperating uh with um authorities uh this is my suggestion my hypothesis for what happened i would suggest these four gentlemen were thought they were 
uh, involved in an anti-terrorism drill. Uh, their train, however, to be on time for that drill and to be part of that drill was cancelled. By the time they actually got to King's Cross, mayhem had ensued, bombs had gone off, and I think it's quite credible to suggest that they panicked, realising that perhaps they were about to be painted as patsies. Uh, the phones were down in London at the time, surprise, surprise, so they couldn't really communicate with anybody. So perhaps they thought, right, well, we'll go to, you know, the ITV office or BBC or whoever's in Canary Wharf, an independent newspaper or whoever's there at the time, and we'll talk to some journalists and tell them that it wasn't us. We weren't on these trains, blah, blah, blah. Perhaps just to tell the, their story and, and protect themselves, they might have just smelt a rat. So when you've got patsies who are on the loose, you need to get rid of them immediately. And I would suggest perhaps a squad of uh, snipers was sent in to uh, commit an executive action and remove those very embarrassing patsies who are still alive. There's also all sorts of other things in this book that blow apart the official narrative. Like I said, with all of these things, you push that narrative and it falls to pieces, okay? The same with this COVID farce, the same with all of these things. You push hard enough and they all fall over, okay? There's plenty of other things in the book. I won't, uh, you know, I can't go on forever in, in detail about them, but, uh, you know, I mean, other things that, uh, you know, come to mind is that supposedly these fellows were carrying backpacks and they were carrying backpacks, but probably the patsies, you know, had nothing of consequence in their backpacks. But the official story was that they were carrying these backpacks and, and committed suicide bombings in the trains, but many of the witnesses, people who survived the bombings, said that the blasts actually occurred from under the train carriages, not from inside them. And, in fact, I've seen photos that show that the blasts have erupted through from underneath through the floors of the train carriages. So, in fact, the bombs were underneath the trains in the um you know wheel carriage not inside the trains i think that's a fundamental issue the trains the the remains the wreckage of those affected train carriages was taken away and destroyed almost immediately it's a bit like 9 11 and the uh, remains of the buildings being taken away and destroyed as quickly as possible um tampering and in fact destroying a crime scene is a pretty obvious sign of guilt from those responsible i would suggest anyway that's terror on the tube it's relevant because the war on terror has vanished for two and a half years remember you were Cast your mind back. It's not always easy, I know, but if you cast your mind back, you were meant to be terror, you know, terrorized by our Islamic friends. Um, and all of a sudden, boom, that operation's over. And we change gears. And it's time for the next operation. Anyway. Uh, oh, the fellow who wrote this book. Uh, Nick Collistrom really recommends if you're more of a video person than a book person, I'm a book person. Uh, he recommends a video called uh, Seven uh, of the Seventh Ripple Effect. I haven't seen it, so I can't I can't uh, pass comment on it. But Collistrom highly recommends it. So if you're a video person, not so much of a book person, perhaps you might want to track down that video. There's an address for it there. Thank you, Ed. It's called Seventh of the Seven. That's a seven stroke, seven ripple effect. Um, Collistrum highly recommends it. Um, it um, independently comes to many of the same conclusions as he did, apparently. Um, I haven't seen it, um, but he does recommend it very, very highly indeed. So uh, if you're interested in further information, of which there is a great deal, uh, you might want to have a look at that. You poor long-suffering souls. I feel that I've probably gone on for long enough now. Uh, so let's call it a day there. Let's pack up stumps. And um, I will bid you farewell. 
from All Out of Gu uh, Bubblegum, episode number 10. Uh, until same bat time, same bat channel next week. Uh, look after yourselves. Uh, think clearly. Be brave. Don't be frightened because that's they want you to be frightened. So always, this is one of my little personal maxims, do whatever, don't do what they want. You know, they have to be frightened and disabled and um, useless. Be the opposite of all those things. You know, if they want you to follow all their stupid rules and their stupid laws. Good people break bad laws. I should probably stop right now, shouldn't I? Um, just don't do what they want, you know? Anyway, that's enough from me. Um, thank you for watching All Out of Bubblegum, episode 10. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you.